Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second session in the Fish Monitoring and Assessment webinar series. My name is Jen Bayer, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. In case we haven't met, I work for the USGS Northwest Pacific Islands Regional Office, where I lead the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership, or PNAP for short. PNAMP, along with StreamNet program, has co-led the planning of this webinar series, and I'd like to thank the planning group, which has included 13 people from a variety of organizations. This has been a series of talks that started last October um, and are running through the end of February. So we're hope hoping that you caught one in the past and that you'll continue to stick with us. We have great talks lined up every Thursday afternoon in January. And skipping the first week of February, then the last three weeks of February, so you get one week break in there. They are one o'clock to two thirty Pacific time. The today and the next two weeks of January will be focused on fish monitoring and assessment topics, and February will be focused on data management topics. Today, I'm joined by one of our planning group members, Marika Dobos from Idaho Department of Fish and Game, who will be tackling the, um, well, helping <laughs> introduce our speakers in just a bit. Um, and in a minute here, I'm going to turn off my camera. So when you see me disappear. It's simply that my um, internet bandwidth in my home office is a little dicey. So this next slide, please, is today's agenda. Um, we have two great speakers. I mentioned Marika will introduce them. Um, just want to give you an idea of how we're going to flow through the day. We'll have Tom give us his presentation. We'll have a short question and answer period. Then John will give his talk and we'll conclude with first questions just for John. And then if we have a little bit of time, we'll have an open uh, window for questions at the end. Next slide. Um, first, we want to get a little quick tips on navigating this meeting platform in case you haven't used Microsoft Teams. First off, um, as always, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. And uh, if you forget, we do have the ability to do that from here, <laughs> but it's better if you pay attention. If you're on the phone, um, instead of using your computer audio, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. Um, there's a mi microphone icon on your toolbar, which is how you do that. Um, also, the video, we ask our speakers to have that on, but typically not everybody. It's just a little too distracting. You can see the arrows here um, point out this uh, chat window and that will be used several times today. So we want to draw your attention to that. And if you are having trouble with your audio, check the device settings, which if you click on the ellipse, you get this drop down menu. It's at the top of that. So explore there if you're having troubles with your audio. Um, and as always, uh, this is a ongoing pr changing product from Microsoft. <laughs> so these things might be a little different for you. And if you're really struggling, drop a note in the chat and um, well, one of the PNAP staff will try to help you out. All right, so as far as questions and answers, we'll have the constraint time at the end of each speaker for questions and answers, but you're always welcome to put your question in the chat. You can hold it to the end or you can put it in when it occurs to you. We'll circle back around to that when we have a window. If you want to speak, raise your hand. That will um, draw your name to the top of the list of the attendees and help us see that, you're, that you want to speak. And then we'll call on you so you can unmute yourself just to kind of do uh, help with um, controlling noise and time management. So, all right, next slide. Um, covered. So just for fun and to help you learn a little bit more about Teams, we're going to do a little bit of live polling using Mentimeter. So um, again, that toolbar, you'll see the chat window. Um, draw your attention to that. Click on the chat window and you'll see that my coworker, Amy, has dropped a poll in there and um, let's call it an icebreaker poll. It's just for fun. If you could humor me and uh, quick click on that and um, I'll give you a minute to react. If you're having trouble, um, you, you can also access it through menti.com and using the code at the top of the slide there. So our question today is what, what would be your preference? Swimming with the fishes or flying with the birds? I think we have a lot of flyers today. And if you're in a place with the weather like I'm experiencing in Hood River, Oregon, which is stunningly clear and beautiful, <laughs> sunny sky, I think I would love to be flying with the birds today. All right. So that was just to give you a flavor for Microsoft Teams and how to navigate a little bit in there. And um, also opportunity for us to learn a little bit about you. <laughs> 
All right, so now I'm going to pass the microphone over to Marika, um, or she will introduce our first speaker. Hey. Hi everyone, um, my name is Marika Dobos. I'm a anatomist staff biologist for the Clearwater region for Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Our first speaker today is Thomas DeLomas. Um, Thomas has spent a lot of time in the lab. I don't know if he likes it or he's just torturing himself, um, but he's uh, worked on some biomedical research, ag food engineering, um, a little bit with uh, nanotechnology and of course uh, a little bit with fish so he uh, earned his master's at kentucky state university and a phd at ohio state and he will be sharing with us um, some of his recent work measuring ploidy with non-lethal tissue samples and amplican sequencing Right. And uh, Thomas is currently uh, working with Idaho Fish and Game under um, Pacific State Marine Fisheries Commission contract with the Eagle Fish Genetics Lab in Eagle. Thank you, Marika. So yeah, today I'm going to talk about um, some new techniques to measure ploidy um, using Amplicon sequencing, uh, which is a, a versatile technique that we use in the lab for genotyping, but we're repurposing to measure ploidy as well. So just a quick review, ploidy refers to the number of copies um, of each chromosome in a somatic cell of an individual. So most studied fish are diploid, uh, just as humans are, meaning they have two copies of each chromosome. Uh, and polyploids, on the other hand, uh, have more than two copies. So a triploid would have three copies, a tetraploid would have four, uh, and so on and so forth. So triploidy can be artificially induced in fish uh, in, a, in the hatchery, and this is done with typically with heat or pressure shocks uh, soon after fertilization. Uh, it almost always results in sterility, uh, which is a very useful uh, attribute for fish that you want to stock. Um, so fisheries managers can stock uh, sterile triploids in order to increase angling opportunities without some of the drawbacks that would come from stocking feral fish. Uh, so, for example, you could stock triploids and then you wouldn't have to be concerned about you know, overpopulation from uncontrolled reproduction, uh, or if you were stocking triploids in an area where there were, um, and there was a native diploid population of the same species, uh, using triploids, you wouldn't have to worry about uh, sort of genetic pollution from, uh, from the stocked fish interbreeding with the wild fish. Triploids are also sometimes used in aquaculture. Uh, they, you can sometimes obtain uh, higher yields with triploids. Uh, it varies between species, but the, the idea is the fish isn't uh, investing as much energy into reproductive development, and so that can boost your yield. Uh, triploids can also be used on farms to prevent escapees from breeding with the wild fish um, in the same region. In addition to triploidy being induced, it can also occur spontaneously. Uh, it does happen in the wild, uh, but more often we see it occurring spontaneously in the hatchery. Uh, typically, it's at very low frequencies. Uh, and this is uh, the mechanism here is retention of the second polar body after fertilization. So the triploids have uh, two copies of each chromosome from the mother and one copy from the father. There are some factors in the hatchery that seem to increase the rate of spontaneous triploidy. Uh, the most uh, well-studied one would be aging of the oocytes post-ovulation. Uh, so this is, you know, if the female ovulates and you strip the oocytes, and then maybe they sit around for a, uh, an extended period of time before fertilization. Um, in some species that's been observed to increase the rate of spontaneous triploidy. Uh, it's also been found that some females are predisposed to um, to having offspring that are spontaneously triploid. And uh, it does seem, um, there's a couple of studies looking at this that um, that show that that predispos predisposition does seem to be inherited. Um, spontaneous triploidy is particularly problematic for white sturgeon, uh, which we'll touch on a little later. So the first problem we're addressing is we need a method to determine ploidy. 
Uh, so we need this method to monitor our triploid inducing uh, treatments to make sure our fish that we intend to be sterile triploids uh, actually are. Um, in some situations, uh, we also need to monitor Floydian hatcheries, uh, particularly white sturgeon, where they seem to be uh, notably affected by this uh, spontaneous polyploidy. Uh, and then finally, when we're genotyping populations of fish um, that have mixed ploidies, so maybe we're um, genotyping samples from a system that has a natural diploid uh, population and a stocked triploid population as well, we need to be able to infer ploidy in order to obtain accurate genotypes. So the existing techniques to infer ploidy, uh, the most popular ones are Coulter counter and flow cytometer. Uh, these typically use blood samples um, and they, they do require either fresh tissue samples, again, usually blood, uh, or specially preserved samples. Um, this, uh, this adds some logistical challenges. If you're sampling fish in the field, you, know, you have to be able to obtain and transport blood back to the lab uh, quick enough for it to be used. Um, and even if you're in a hatchery uh, situation, um, sampling blood can be, uh, can be labor intensive, particularly if you're sampling blood non-lethally and with small fish. There's also an extra expense for ploidy analysis with these techniques. Um, so if you're going to be genotyping these samples um, and that's what you need the ploidy for, uh, then you have to both cover the genotyping cost and the ploidy inference cost. So an amplicon sequencing uh, based method would allow um, any sample with intact DNA to be utilized. Uh, so for example, fin clips and ethanol or fin clips dry on to a filter paper, uh, which can alleviate most of the logistical challenges with using blood or fresh tissue samples. And it also allows ploidy inference and genotyping with the same assay. Um, so if you're genotyping these samples regardless, uh, you eliminate that extra expense. There are many different variations of amplicon sequencing. The technique we use is referred to as GT-seq. And uh, it's, it's sort of a, uh, a high level GT seq is uh, it's basically a PCR with one to 400 primer pairs, and then you sequence the mix of amplicons. Um, people, when they hear sequencing, they often think expensive, but this does turn out to be a very cost effective method of genotyping with the consumables running about $5 per sample. So amplicon sequencing produces uh, read counts for a set of SNPs. So this is what your data looks like at a fairly raw level. You have a set of SNPs and each SNP has two alleles and you have counts for reads for each of those alleles within each of those SNPs. So this is the data that uh, we're gonna be modeling based on ploidy uh, to try to differentiate between, uh, between different ploidies. So the read counts, it's fairly intuitive that you'd expect the number of read counts to be proportional to the number of copies of each allele in the genome. Uh, so with the diploid, you have three potential genotypes. Um, so depending on the genotype of the fish, you might expect either all reads to be A, all to be B, or half and half. Uh, whereas with the, a triploid, again, you have the homozygous genotypes where you expect uh, more or less all reads to be one allele. And then you have the heterozygous genotypes where you've got an unbalanced ratio of two uh, of one allele and one of the other. So if you focus on these heterozygous genotypes, uh, you could see how uh, with these read counts, um, if you, you know, calculated the ratio of allele A to allele B and it was closer to a one-to-one -one ratio, um, you might expect that sample to be diploid if it was closer to a two to one ratio, you would expect that fish to be triploid. So that's the intuition behind this method that I'm going to be describing. Um, but of course, doing that manually would be uh, quite labor intensive and tedious across even one sample, let alone you know, a couple thousand samples. So uh, we developed a more automated algorithm to perform this. First, we screen out the homozygous genotypes. Um, and with triploids and diploids, that's, uh, that's very straightforward. Uh, the method we use is a simple binomial test. Uh, 
And then we're modeling the read counts at the remaining genotypes as binomial random variables. So the difference between the two models, one model for diploid and one model for triploid, would be the, uh, the probability of success of that underlying, underlying uh, binomial variable. Uh, we, we do utilize locus specific estimates of sequencing error and allelic bias. Um, and those turn out to, to help a little, um, but they don't seem to be uh, particularly important compared to just using some, uh, some generic estimates that fairly well represent most loci. After we fit these models, we calculate a log likelihood ratio to compare the ploides, and we, um, we can then assign ploidy based on that LLR uh, by comparing it to some critical values, which we can empirically determine with a set of known ploidy samples. So determining the critical values, um, there's a couple different ways to go about this, but uh, probably the most straightforward is to look at um, a set of known diploid and triploid samples. So here we have a GTC panel of almost 300 loci. Uh, we have um, some diploid, Chinook salmon, and triploids. And you can see over here, this is a graph, the distributions of LLR for those known ploidy samples. So we can see that the, um, the two ploidy types are very well separated by this LLR metric. Um, and we can uh, visually assess this and decide on some critical values of, you know, over 100, we'll call you triploid, less than negative five, we'll call you diploid, and anything in between we'll call ambiguous. Um, so the uh, straightforward way to, to think about these critical values is a sort of a training data set and test data set approach. So this would be our training data set where we look at some known ploidy samples and we decide on some reasonable critical values. And then we're going to assess uh, accuracy with some different known ploidy samples. And I'm going to show you uh, a couple of different uh, GTC panels, but these are all panels targeting 250 to 379 loci. So first we'll look at some uh, different triploid and diploid Chinook salmon. And again, I've got these same critical values on these here, and all the samples are categorized correctly. Again, we've got good separation between diploids and triploids based on this LLR. Switching species and going to some triploid and diploid brook trout. Uh, again, we have very good separation. I'm, I'm showing the same critical values here. And again, we see they perform well. Uh, this is a very similar panel, even though it's a different species, uh, but it's similar in the number of markers and sequencing depth and heterozygosity of the population. Uh, we achieved the same results for rainbow trout and F1 cutthroat trout, rainbow trout hybrids. Um, the, they all, the graphs all look the same. You get good separation between diploids and triploids. And that's sort of so um, points to with amplicon sequencing with these panels of a couple hundred loci. Um, the diploids and the triploids, they look really different. Um, it's quite easy based on the sequencing data to separate them out uh, with these uh, log likelihood ratios. The F1 hybrids are an interesting case where we're using a panel of species diagnostic SNPs uh, to assess ploidy. And the nice thing about the F1s is all those SNPs are heterozygous in the F1. So you can use, you know, if you have a panel of 30 markers, you can use all 30 to infer ploidy. You don't have to worry about weeding out markers with homozygous genotypes. Um, I did show the critical values um, as being the same across panels. Uh, this doesn't have to be the case. They can be panel or species specific. Um, but in this case, the panels were all very similar in terms of number of markers, uh, heterozygosity, and sequencing depth. So the using the same critical values um, performed well. So the next problem that uh, we addressed was, you know, trying to address comparisons other than diploid and triploid. Um, so we wanted to generalize this method to ploides other than diploidy and triploidy. And we're motivated uh, again by white sturgeon. So white sturgeon are, um, are a little odd in, term, in the fish world. They're ancestral octoploids, um, which means they have eight copies of each chromosome. 
And in the hatchery, we see a spontaneous increase to 12N um, occasionally. So this is equivalent to spontaneous triploidy. Going from diploid to triploid is the same as going from octoploid to dodecaploid. You've got a 50% increase in ploidy. And again, that's uh, thought to be due to spontaneous retention of the second polar body. And the, the, there's some very nice work I uh, recently published showing that the frequency of this spontaneous increase um, is influenced by a variety of hatchery conditions. Um, the environmental conditions affecting the the oocytes after ovulation and immediately after fertilization. To further complicate matters, crossing uh, an octoploid and a dodecaploid yields a decaploid. So we've got three ploides to consider uh, when we're analyzing white sturgeon. To generalize the model, um, we adopted a beta binomial mixture model. Um, and the individual components are defined by their mean, uh, which depend, is fixed uh, depending on the genotype state that the component is representing. Uh, and we can also incorporate sequencing error and allelic bias into that. And then we have a variance parameter or an over dispersion parameter, uh, which is fit as part of the model fitting process. We also added a uniform noise component uh, to try to address panels that might be a little noisier than the panels we uh, we previously were working with. So this model is fit with an expectation maximization algorithm. And again, where you're going to compare ploides by calculating log likelihood ratios. Um, it's also worth mentioning you could use, a, depending on the situation, you could use a maximum likelihood estimate or an information criteria on approach. So the improvements of this model, or the, uh, the first model, which just handled diploids and triploids, are of course that it's generalized to any ploidy. Um, it also is specifically handling over dispersion and uniform noise. So it, um, it could be more applicable or perform uh, better in situations where the sequencing data is, um, is a little noisy or you have um, higher rates of over dispersion. We're also modeling all genotypes, not just heterozygous genotypes. So we avoid that initial step of trying to filter out homozygous genotypes, which may be not as straightforward uh, at higher ploidy levels. Uh, there are some drawbacks to the generalized model. You're inferring more parameters. Um, so you, you have a, if you were working with a panel that had a particularly low sequencing depth, uh, you might worry about overfitting. And of course, you have more computation time, about three seconds to sample, which doesn't sound bad, um, but it can be uh, a little frustrating when you're analyzing uh, several thousand samples at one time. So the first thing we wanted to see is, does this generalized model still work with diploids and triploids? Uh, so again, we've got 80 diploid and 93 triploid Chinook salmon. And, and again, just as with the first model, we see excellent separation between the two ploides. Um, so I don't have critical values on here, um, but you can see there's good separation between these distributions. So defining some critical values to use to infer ploidy would be straightforward. We then moved on to our motivating example of white sturgeon. And recently, uh, some of our collaborators at CritFic have developed a panel of SNPs uh, for white sturgeon. And it turns out that these SNPs are tetraploid and ancestral octoploids. So there's been some level of redeploidization over evolutionary time. And the, and the, the side effect of that is our ancestral ploides of 8N, 10N, and 12N correspond to ploides of 4, 5, and 6N with the SNPs and in the model. So we had 19 4N white sturgeon. And so this um, LLR plot is going to be a little different when you're comparing more than two ploides. Um, it's not quite as straightforward, uh, but the principles are the same. Um, so what I have here are the log likelihood ratios of the 4N model, which is the true model, compared to the alternate ploides, so either 5N or 6N. So all these samples are 4N. And uh, if you're not familiar with uh, log likelihood ratios, the way to interpret this would be uh, the further away from zero and the more positive that ratio, uh, 
the better fitting the foreign model is compared to the alternative model. Uh, so we can see here that um, the foreign model fits these foreign samples uh, much better than either the 5N or the 6N model. We have plenty of separation from zero, which would uh, zero would correspond to the models fitting about equally. Um, so the fact that we're seeing good separation of these distributions from zero um, shows that we can, based on the LLR, identify the foreign samples as opposed to the alternative ploides. Uh, similar results for some 6N samples. Uh, again, the, these plots are comparing the 6N model, which is the true ploidy, to the alternates of 4N or 5N. And again, we see good separation from zero, uh, so we're confident we can uh, separate the 6N samples uh, from the other ploidies. And then finally, um, some 5N samples. Uh, again, we see the, you know, the vast majority of these samples um, are quite uh, distinct. Um, their LLRs are separated from zero sufficiently. Uh, we did have uh, one or two samples that were a little closer to zero than in the other ploides, um, but we're still, um, the most likely model was still 5N for all of these, and we still are seeing some pretty good separation. Uh, so again, we're confident that we can identify all three ploides uh, based on this model and uh, Amplicon sequencing panel with 325 loci. So the generalized model is performing well across a range of ploides, including um, assessing diploidy and triploidy. Uh, there are a couple of limitations uh, to this method that are worth mentioning. The first is that uh, we can't separate individuals when the higher ploidy is formed by duplicating a lower ploidy genome. An example of this would be if you're creating a tetraploid by suppressing the first mitotic division. Um, and so the intuition behind that is you're starting off with a diploid genotype. So you have these three genotype categories and you double it. So even though you're tetraploid, you're only left with these three genotype categories, um, which have the same uh, proportion of allele A to allele B that you would expect in a diploid. So there's no way from sequencing data that you could uh, pick these apart. This form of polyploidy is relatively rare though, so it doesn't apply in many cases. The second limitation is that comparing ploidies that are multiples of each other, so for example, diploid and tetraploid, it's more difficult than comparing ploidies that aren't multiples of each other. Um, it can still be done, um, but it, it is a little more difficult statistically. Um, and this is because the higher ploidy model will always have a likelihood higher or equal to the lower ploidy model. Uh, now, again, we can still infer ploidy, but we have to rely on the LLR values, and we can't simply look at which model is most likely. Um, so this is some simulated data showing how, how you might expect that to look. Um, distinguishing between diploids and tetraploids, uh, the Tetraploid model would always have a better fit or an equal fit to the diploid model, but for diploid samples, you'd expect the models to fit about equally, um, so their LLRs would be clustered close to zero. And the tetraploid samples, you would expect the tetraploid model to have a, a much superior fit to the diploid model, so their LLRs would be uh, more diverged from zero. And so you, with adequate uh, sequencing depth and a number of loci, you should still be able to get uh, separation between the distributions of LLR based on ploidy. So I, I do have several people to thank. I'd like to acknowledge BPA for providing funding. I'd like to thank the staff of Idaho Fish and Games Fish Health Laboratory for helping collect samples of known ploidy fish. Um, and I have many people to thank at the Eagle Fish Genetics Lab for helping genotype the salmon samples in the study. And I'd also like to thank uh, my collaborators at Critvik and UC Davis uh, for providing the white sturgeon data. So the, uh, the functions to fit these models and infer ploidy are available as an R package on GitHub. Uh, 
And um, if you'd like more details, um, I, I glossed over some of the mathematical details, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and there are more details in uh, this uh, manuscript describing the diploid and triploid model and a preprint describing the generalized model. And so with that, uh, as long as we have sufficient time, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Tom. Yes, we have time for questions. We want to, I'm looking at the chat. Go ahead and type, okay. The first question, Leo Rose, how long does it take to run a sample? We typically, uh, our DNA extraction protocol typically runs overnight and then, you know, theoretically you could run through everything and, um, and put it on the sequencer the next day. So sort of 48 hours. Um, but the, the thing about uh, these sequencing techniques um, is it's most efficient to, well, you sort of need to batch samples. Um, so we'll genotype um, a couple thousand samples at a time. Thanks, Tom. We have another speaker, and then we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, so wait, I have another question coming in from, um, I think, a staff member with the Kootenai tribe. What methods did you use to confirm ploidy? Uh, yes, yeah, so for the uh, salmonid samples, the um, most of them were confirmed with flow cytometry. Some of the diploids were confirmed by successful reproduction. And then for the white sturgeon, the uh, we used a culture counter. All right, thanks, Tom. Any other questions? Or you either type it in the chat or raise your hand. Okay, well, if it pops up or you're having trouble with your audio, know that there are there's some time at the end where you can uh, ask Tom again for questions. So with that, I, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. Um, thank you so much, Tom. That was a great talk. Um, having uh, memories of things I was just barely glimmering. So it's really nice to hear that. And, and I'm going to turn it back over to Marika to introduce our next speaker. Okay. Our next speaker is John Hargrove. Uh, John got, Hargrove got his master's and his PhD at, at University of Florida, where he was uh, working on a diverse uh, background of genetic techniques and applications, including um, using SNPs to look at hybridization dynamics on black bass. He worked on a variety of projects with black bass in Florida and in South Africa. Um, he's also worked with the, um, some other marine fish and um, used genetic techniques to look at invasion history of non-native fish species and a variety of other projects. So currently he is a, a geneticist, um, again with our uh, genetics lab down in Eagle and is working with uh, genetic stock identification and parentage-based tagging techniques to uh, promote conservation and management of salmon and steelhead in the Snake River Basin. And that will be his talk that he focuses on with you today. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and I'm going to jump back in. This is Jen again. So sorry. We have one more poll. Do you want to do that, John? Uh, it's it's OK. No need. Okay. I think we're fine. Okay. Sorry about that. I just got the sequence wrong. <laughs> Thanks, John. OK. All right. Um, yeah, so I just want to start off by um, thanking my uh, collaborators on this project. Uh, this was uh, the, the work that I'm presenting was uh, required a lot of effort by a lot of people. Um, so that includes Carlos Camacho, Bill Schrader, uh, John Powell, Tom DeLomas, John Hess, Sean Naram, and uh, Supervisor Matt Campbell. So uh, let's see here. Yeah, so, um, so abundance estimation. So obviously the talk is about um, estimating or, or the use of, of parentage-based tagging to inform abundance estimation. And, um, uh, you know, having some uh, understanding of adult abundance is really a central tenet of, of fisheries management. And it plays a, a critical role in, um, you know, setting harvest levels, quantifying responses to management uh, strategies and, and monitoring recovery efforts. Um, of course, uh, without some level of understanding of uncertainty, estimates of abundance are, are not necessarily, it's, it's limited. And so, you know, the, the picture here is, is obviously, a, there is a uh, example of Atlantic cod where um, essentially, you know, without some level of understanding, uh, 
uh, their abundances drop to critically low levels. Um, and, and so in terms of estimating adult abundance, uh, we commonly use physical marks and tags. And in populations that receive hatchery supplementation, um, uh, physical marks and tags can be used to identify a subset of that population. And so the focus of my talk today is really um, is understanding um, or exploring this, this sort of less explored topic of, you know, what happens when we um, when we misclassify a hatchery fish as a wild fish. And given that there's over 900 hatcheries that are operating in North America, um, you know, this is a, a topic of, of potential widespread application. And so uh, the um, the technology I'm talking about today is parentage-based tagging. Um, essentially, it, it represents an alternative to physical marks and tags. And the basis for it is that you generate multi-locus genotypes for a set of broodstock, a, com a complete set of parents that are responsible for producing offspring. Um, and, and in doing so, you genetically tag all of your, uh, your hypothetical offspring. So in this case, you've got you know, this hypothetical hatchery X brood year 2014, and this would represent your pool of potential parents. Um, from them, you would take a genetic fin clip, um, and then those fin clips would then be extracted and you would generate a multi-locus genotype for each individual. So we would, um, in this case, we've got our hypothetical genetic database of all of our potential parents with each row corresponding to an individual parent, right? And so we're going to record uh, metadata. So in the hatchery, we can record which males were crossed with which females, which individuals were males or females, um, and, and uh, physical data such as size, for example. And then armed with this genetic database, we can then um, intercept a fish, whether uh, a sample of interest, this could be um, a fish that's targeted in a recreational or commercial fishery could be sampled at a hatchery or it could be um, sampled on the natal spawning grounds. And what we could do is, again, take a fin clip from that individual, that, that individual of interest, create a multi-locus genotype and then use parentage analysis, running it against our, um, our, our genetic database. And if we get a PBT hit, in this case, what that means is that we identify with a high level of confidence that we know the mother and father, uh, um, you know, the, the mother and father of our sample of interest is in our genetic database. Then we know that that individual is of hatchery origin. Um, so there are um, several benefits of taking a parentage-based tagging approach. Um, first off is this whole concept of, of tag shedding. So, um, you know, uh, genetic, uh, genetic tags are permanent, which means that, you know, they're not necessarily going to be lost. Uh, the example here is just in the upper right hand corner is, a, is a, a picture of a coded wire tag. And so, you know, a lot of times this is a very common tag that's applied to um, salmon and steelhead smolts. Uh, a lot of this is administered or they are tagged, these, these smolts are tagged um, using automated trailers, which have this very high rate of, of conversion, you know, lots of a very high proportion of the smolts are, are in fact tagged, but there remains this potential for, um, for tags to be shed. Uh, this, the second point here is that, you know, when we, when we make a PBT assignment, when we get a PBT hit, um, it's, it's relatively unambiguous. And, and the reason why is because, you know, we're using likely, likelihood-based methods. Um, and what we're doing with those is that we're controlling for potential, the potential for false positives and false negatives. And so the, um, uh, this little picture in the lower right, what we're showing is, you know, adipose fin clips are very commonly used to discriminate or to differentiate between hatchery, hatchery salmon, hatchery reared salmon and steelhead relative to their wild con specifics. And in the top row, you know, of that, of that diagram, you can see that, you know, the, uh, if, a, if a fish has in fact got a fully clipped adipose fin, that it's easy to discern that that is of hatchery origin. And likewise, in the lower row, you can see that, it, you know, that if there is a fully intact adipose fin, then that is very likely a wild fish. But when you get into these intermediate rows, that's where you have this potential for there to be a subjective element. You know, is it clipped or is it not? Um, whereas PBT is, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, the point here about few adults, it takes few adults to tag many offspring. So, you know, for highly fecund species, you can um, cross one female with two males. So in that case, you're taking three fin clips. 
And that can potentially tag two to 3,000 offspring responsible, you know, that those parents are responsible for. Um, this point here about high genotyping success rates, well, you know, a, a pretty reasonable question is that you go out to a hatchery, you take a bunch of fin clips, and how many of those fin clips actually end up turning into genotypes that can be put into your database? And, and the answer is that that value is very high. So, you know, for, um, for our lab that's been doing this, initiated in 2008, you know, we're looking at greater than or equal to 95% genotyping success rate. Um, for an entire uh, brood stock. Um, and another thing is, you know, originally I showed a picture of a coded wire tag. Um, you know, one of the benefits of using PVT is that it's non-lethal, meaning that you could, in theory, intercept a fish on its way to the spawning ground. You could take a fin clip and release it, um, and you could uh, run parentage-based tagging or, or run parentage analysis without having to sacrifice it. So coded wire tag, on the other hand, you'd have to first identify that there is a CWT and then remove the snout to decode the CWT to identify hatchery and source of origin. So in terms of um, you know, the applications of PVT, so really the, um, the, the framework for this was first proposed by um, Eric Anderson and John Carlos Garza back in 2005. And it was sort of designed as an alternative to coded wire tags um, for use in, in, in hatchery supplementation of salmonids. Um, of course, um, you know, this, this is a technology that's been around for some time. So, you know, we're calling it PBT, but in reality, you know, this stuff has, has been applied in this case, uh, pallid sturgeon. Um, essentially what they did is they, you know, very similar, they, they had taken fin clips from all of the parents. Um, in order to identify whether or not offspring were hatchery or wild. And um, it just was not done with the PBT name. Um, Craig Steele, um, so, so over the last 10 years, we've sort of seen a more widespread application. In this case, uh, colleague Craig Steele um, uh, kind of documented the, the validation of PBT as it's been applied to steelhead in the Snake River Basin. And we've also seen, um, you know, from a hatchery management perspective, we've, we've also seen stuff like the description of run specific life history characteristics, contributions to sport fisheries. Uh, Terry Beecham and his lab up in BC have applied this to a number of different salmonid species, um, you know, coho, chinook, um, and pink salmon, for example. And even more so recently, we've seen the application to non-salmonids, uh, similar to the, um, you know, the pallid sturgeon example um, earlier, uh, we've seen it applied to blueback herring um, in uh, coastal rivers of North Carolina. So um, in terms of, so I've kind of just brushed over, but the main, the main take home here is that, you know, PBT was sort of envisioned as a tool for um, hatchery management. And, and another uh, more recent review, this was 2019, again by Craig Steele, provides a really nice overview of the ways that this technology has been um, applied um, from a management perspective. So um, as many of you are likely very aware, um, salmon and steelhead have experienced significant declines over the last um, 100 years, and they face high rates of imperilment. Uh, from Gustafsson et al., we see a pie charts which show, in this case, steelhead ESUs or evolutionary significant units, and the proportion of populations that are either not listed, which would be in white, ones that are listed under the Endangered Species Act, or ones that have gone extinct using uh, gray and black, respectively. So, take, main take home message here for steelhead as well as Chinook is that they are experiencing that they're at historic lows. So their abundance is, is very low. Simultaneously, we also see that hatchery supplementation efforts are occurring on a, on a very large scale. And so this particular schematic is from the North Pacific Anadromous Fish Commission, and it illustrates that over the last um, you know, 20 or 30 years, the US has been um, out or has been um, stocking about 2 billion salmonids uh, collectively. Uh, through over time. So, so the first point is that, you know, wild returns are very low and that hatchery, hatchery um, fish are uh, very abundant. Um, and so, um, you know, this, 
Uh, currently, or up until the advent of PBT, we really relied upon a combination of adipose fin clips to identify that a fish was of hatchery origin and or coated wire tags. Um, and coated wire tags are, are less common than adipose fin clips. For example, um, in, in Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, about 115 million Chinook have been ad, uh, ad clipped on an annual basis. So, so we do have these tools um, available to identify hatchery, um, hatchery fish. But the caveat here is that the complex uh, is, is that the management of salmon and steelhead is quite complex. And what I mean by that is that there may be, for a variety of reasons, fish that are intentionally released from a hatchery without a tag or a clip. So taking all of that together, so we know that hatchery fish are abundant. We know that wild fish are um, are the opposite. They're they're more scarce than they have been. Um, and, and they may or may not have a physical tag, then what the objectives of this study were um, was to apply PBT to um, uh, spring summer Chinook and steelhead returning to the Snake River Basin and to um, use this to identify our source of origin. And then escapement in this, in this context is just referring to the number of adults that are returning to their uh, natal spawning grounds that have managed to escape uh, recreational or commercial harvest. So, so what we did is we essentially we applied PBT, and um, you know if we determined that something was of hatchery origin using parentage-based tagging, we de we developed estimates of escapement using that data, and then we ran it separately, ignoring that data, um, to see if we noticed significant differences. And then another objective of this study was just to assess, you know, yeah, sure. So we're running PBT and we're getting these hits, but we want to make sure that those those PBT hits are in, indeed accurate. So just to kind of give you a broad um, sense of where we are. So this is obviously in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and here's a map showing the um, Snake River Basin, which encompasses about 277,000 square kilometers. Um, Important to note is that the Snake River Basin was once or historically responsible for producing about 40% of the spring summer Chinook that were um, returning to the Columbia River Basin and about 55% of returning steelhead. Uh, this map here shows um, in blue the current distribution of salmon and steelhead. Uh, green denotes historical um, distribution. And then these, um, these black marks along the uh, Columbia and Snake River denote uh, dams. And while the construction of these dams has been implicated in the declines of salmon and steelhead, they also represent this unique opportunity to um, enumerate fish because they have to cross fish ladders in order to get across these dams in order to return to their natal habitats. Um, and then just to kind of hone in on the specifics of, um, in this case, you know, so we'll be talking about spring, summer Chinook, although we do have runs of fall, but for here, we're just confining that to spring, summer, as well as steelhead. So these are, these are species which have been listed um, uh, under the Endangered Species Act for, you know, 23 to 28 years. So we know that they're at critically low levels. Um, alongside that, um, Fish and Game, as uh, Idaho Fish and Game and collaborators within the Snake River Basin have, have um, are, are um, pursuing supplementation for, you know, for a variety of purposes, but this is on a relatively large scale. So in the Snake River Basin, approximately 20 million smolts are released annually, um, including uh, Chinook and, and Steelhead. And so the take home there is just that our wild numbers are, are relatively low um, in, in, uh, relative to the number of hatchery fish that are out on the landscape. And then just to bring up this additional point, you know, management within the Snake River Basin is particularly complex. And again, for a variety of reasons, it's entirely possible that fish will be released from a hatchery without any sort of um, uh, a mar physical mark or tag. So um, in terms of how we estimate adult uh, escapement in the Snake River Basin, essentially that is done at the uh, Lower Granite Dam, a uh, picture of it in the upper left-hand corner, and then it's denoted on this map with the red X. And essentially we use uh, data from multiple sources, the first of which is a counting window um, 
that is on the, the fish ladder, which is operated to account for 95% of each of these runs. And, and the data that are provided through this include the number of fish as well as which species is crossing. Now, additionally, we have an adult um, trapping facility, which allows us to put our hands on these fish. And essentially at that point, we're, we're trying to target about 15, somewhere between 15 and 20% of the run. And from that, we get um, estimates of which species we're encountering, uh, physical characteristics such as size, and then also the source of origin. And what I mean by source of origin is that we, you know, for escapement, estimation of escapement purposes, we're really interested in three primary categories. And the first one, as you can see on the far right, is if a fish is encountered in the trap and it has an ad clip, then we know that it is of hatchery origin. In contrast, if we encounter a fish that it has an intact adipose fin, what we can do is we can check for the presence of a coated wire tag, a ventral fin clip, or in the case of steelhead and steelhead only, we can check for dorsal fin erosion. And so what we've got here is that if we see no um, ad, if the, if the adipose is intact, but we uh, observe uh, a tag or mark, then we can identify it as an adipose intact hatchery fish. And the relevance of having this separate category is that what this does is it's, this tells us the number of fish that are of hatchery origin that are ineligible for mark selected fisheries. Now, on the other hand, if we have these adipose intact fish that we encounter in the trap and we check for a, um, uh, a coated wire tag, if we look for physical marks um, or dorsal fin erosion, we can then, we have an additional method of identifying source of origin and that would be uh, by comparing it to our um, our PBT baseline. So that's what this red box indicates is that, you know, this is a, a unique opportunity where if we did not have this tool, we would um, declare it that it was wild. Um, but if we do get a PBT hit, then we can identify it as a being hatchery origin. So in terms of the methods, so just to give you a rundown of our PBT in the Snake River Basin, so um, for the purposes of this research, so we've got six different hatcheries that are responsible for producing steelhead, nine hatcheries that are producing Chinook, plus a whole um, mess of um, satellite release sites. We're taking genetic fin clips. So for this, we sampled brood stock, brood years 2008 to 2015. And during those, we're sampling about 5,000 steelhead annually and about 9,000 Chinook. Um, for this, our genetic database of potential parents, so we essentially we started with a panel of just 95 SNPs and that has expanded through time. So now we're working with upwards of 379 SNPs, but we've got a, a collection of for this for this research somewhere in the order of magnitude of about 110,000 potential parents. And then, um, you know, just to point out, so, you know, in that schematic earlier, I showed uh, that we had, you know, we're not taking samples from the ad clipped fish, but we are taking them from all adipose intact, um, uh, adipose intact adults. And so for the sake of this study, we, we sampled spawn years 2014 and 2018. So the, um, the, the um, statistical procedures associated with uh, estimating escapement is done using the Salmonid composition bootstrap intervals. Again, that takes the raw number of fish that we interpret that we um, uh, that we enumerate at the window count, we then multiply at times uh, the data that we get in the uh, in the fish trap. This is all decomposed. Um, you know, we do this on a weekly time strata, and then we sum all of the time strata together to get um, the number of individuals, you know, escapement estimates for each of these three rearing types, and associated with that are our 90% confidence intervals. And so for for this talk, what we did is we we generated estimates of escapement for, um, you know, for each of these categories. And really this was a, uh, an exercise in accounting, you know, with and without the inclusion of PBT data, how do we see our estimates of wild escapement change? And then in terms of, um, you know, we we're also, again, we we're interested in assessing uh, what is, you know, how accurate are our PBT assignments. And so for this, what we did is we took a collection of wild individuals, which um, were used for genetic stock identification in the Snake River Basin. 
And these are individuals that we would not expect to, um, you know, that these are of, um, you know, to the best of our knowledge, these are of wild origin, so that it would be unlikely that they would um, uh, uh, have parents in our, in our PBT baseline. And so for Chinook, we did a, a comparison using 4,356, uh, a, a combination of adults and juveniles, and we ran that against our PBT baseline. And for Steelhead, we did that with almost 6,000 wild individuals. And then what we were interested in is, in this case, we're quantifying false positives, what proportion of individuals were assigned a, parent, uh, a, a hatchery parent when in fact their parents should not be in the hatchery. And so this would be the number of false assignments divided by the total number of comparisons. So um, straight away, I apologize for giving you a big, a big messy um, table to deal with, but I'll just walk you through this. This, um, you know, on the left-hand side, we see the different species and hatcheries that we're interested in. Here we see this arrow is identifying the estimated number of smolt releases during the study period. And what we see is that it was about 131 million Chinook were released and about um, uh, 45 million steelhead. So um, importantly, our PBT tag rate, so this is the proportion of adults um, for which we have genotyped, um, which are included in the, in the parental database. Um, across Averaging across all hatcheries in years, what we see is that we had about 93% tag rates um, uh, for, uh, for Chinook, and for Steelhead, that was about 96%. So, um, so pretty, pretty high, and when we contrast that with um, the proportion of offspring that either had an ad clip an ad clip plus a CWT, a CWT only or no mark and tag, um, you know, we can see that those numbers vary widely across the different hatcheries. So the example that I show you here, you know, Rapid River for Chinook, um, a very large proportion of the smolts that were released um, had an ad clip and none of them were unmarked, untagged, but that varied as a function of hatchery. Um, and so again, so here are some results. So I, I draw your attention to the schematic on the right hand side. Again, we're not interested in the ad clipped fish, but instead we're looking at the ad opposed fin, you know, the ad intact fish that are um, sampled at Lower Granite Dam. And for this, across these five spawn years, we sampled 21,000, just under 22,000 steelhead and about 16,500 Chinook salmon. So a pretty respectable sample size. Um, so just getting into some results here. So what, what I've got here is just a graph of on the x-axis, we see our spawn year and on the y-axis, we see the number of ad intact fish that were, um, that were trapped at the dam. And so the tan portion represents the, uh, the proportion of these ad intact fish that were determined as wild using a combination of physical marks, tags, as well as PBT. Um, so that's that whole column, uh, or excuse me, so the tan is the, is the natural origin. And the, the red corresponds to those that were identified as hatchery origin only using PBT. And the blue represents the proportion that were identified only using some sort of physical mark or tag. So in this spawn year here, spawn year 2017, what we see is that, you know, again, so we had about 2000 fish that were sampled. We see about 150 Chinook were identified as hatchery um, origin using some sort of physical marker tag alone. And we see that about 683 fish were identified as hatchery origin using only PBT. When we average this across years, what we see is that we're sampling on average about 3,300 uh, adults at the dam that were at intact. And 374 of those on an annual basis were found to be of hatchery origin using a physical marker tag. And almost 650 fish annually were, um, were of hatchery origin based on PBT results. So, you know, a pretty, pretty sizable number, almost 20% of the annual return um, that would have been um, classified as wild if we did not use parentage-based tagging. So here we're just sort of dissecting. So of the fish that were determined to be of hatchery origin using some sort of physical mark and tag, this is just a decomposition, um, whether or not it was a coated wire tag or if it was some physical mark. And we can see that almost all of these Chinook are being identified as hatchery origin based using a coated wire tag. 
when we see the impact um, or when we when we finalize our estimates of escapement, so what we see here, so again, x-axis is your spawn year, y is your estimated um, wild recruitment. Um, you know, the red is, or the salmon color, um, is, is estimated escapement without PBT, and the teal or blue is escapement with PBT. Um, what we can see is that, you know, the, the five asterisks correspond to non-overlapping 95% or 90% confidence intervals. So if we fail to use PBT, we would be over-inflating uh, the wild returns by almost 5,000 fish on an annual basis. So pretty, pretty significant difference. Um, getting into results for steelhead. So again, same, uh, same graph I showed for Chinook, where x-axis is on the spawn year and a number of adults sampled at intact um, adults sampled is on the y-axis. In taking spawn year 2017 again, we sampled about 4,500 at intact steelhead. We identified 714 fish as hatchery origin using only physical marks and tags, and 800 fish as hatchery origin only using PBT. Our average across these spawn years, we see that 4,900 fish approximately were sampled on an annual basis. 583 on an annual basis were identified as hatchery origin using physical marks and tags, and that about 8.3% of the annual return, or 366 fish, um, were identified as hatchery origin only using PBT, so, so less than we saw for Chinook. And when we decompose the fish that were identified as hatchery origin based on physical marks or tags, what we see is that coated wire tags were less impactful in terms of identifying um, steelhead, hatchery origin steelhead, and this other category is present, but, um, and, and this other category is by and large is that dorsal fin erosion, otherwise known as stubbies that are encountered at the dam. So here's our plots of escapement um, estimated across five spawn years for steelhead and um, you know, a couple of things. So four out of the five years had non-overlapping confidence intervals. So again, the difference in estimated escapement is significantly lower when we incorporate PBT results um, on the order magnitude of you know, maybe a couple thousand fish on an annual basis. So not as impactful as, as a Chinook, but still a, a statistically significant overestimation of wild escapement absent the use of PBT. Um, in terms of our um, PBC, PBT assignment accuracy, so for our Chinook, we, we did have four natural origin fish, or putatively natural or, origin fish that did have a hit to the PBT baseline, which based on the number of fish sampled corresponds to a false positive rate of less than one tenth of one percent, which is Pretty reasonable, and for steelhead, we we had no false assignments, or um, which is which is promising. It's good. It implies that you know we're not just willy nilly saying that these fish are of hatchery origin when in fact they're not. So just to kind of run through some basic conclusions from the study, um, you know, so first off um, is this whole point that source of origin um, is difficult to identify just using marks and tags alone. Um, in our case, we sampled 38,000 ad intact adults at the dam, and about 5,000 of those would have been identified as, as wild when in fact they were of hatchery origin. Um, you know, my, my purpose here is not to get on a, um, is to not to do a, um, you know, soapbox of why PBT is the best ever. Instead, what I would make is the argument that PBT is a very complementary tagging approach. Um, in rivers such as the Snake River Basin where, where management is complex. Um, specifically, um, you know, we have programs within our basin where you say, okay, um, you know, we're going to do egg box programs where we take adults, spawn them in a hatchery and take their eggs and put them out onto the landscape in egg boxes so that they are spawned naturally. And in this case, that, you know, PBT is really the only feasible way to identify whether or not those fish are of hatchery origin. Um, and so, you know, so PBT um, is, you know, is, is a very powerful tool for a large, a wide range of, of potential applications. And so um, this point here, that identification of hatchery origin via PBT varied by species. So, you know, so for Chinook, we don't have, uh, there are no studies, so to speak. Um, and so, you know, we picked up a lot more hatchery origin fish for Chinook than we did steelhead. But it's important to note that there's anecdotal evidence that stubbies or the, the expression of the stubby dorsal fin 
varies within steelhead as a function of hatchery. And so in Idaho, a lot of our hatcheries will um, spawn fish on site and then they will rear them at hatcheries in the Magic Valley. And that the expression of dorsal fin erosion at, in Magic Valley hatcheries may differ relative to on-site rearing in facilities such as Dwarshack. So, so, um, so the application of PBT varies by species, or you know, the the proportion of fish detected as hatchery origin may vary by by um, uh, by species. But you know, we also see that there's variation within species as well, and and PBT is is applicable in all scenarios. Um, as Tom alluded to in his talk earlier, you know, everybody, you know, when they think of a program like this, they think it must cost a trillion dollars. Um, but the reality is, is that this is a pretty, pretty cost effective approach. And what I mean by that is, you know, so one option or, or one critique that people might say is, well, if you can estimate the number of fish at a hatchery that have a coated wire tag or an adipose, clan, why, adipose clip, why don't you just extrapolate that and come up with a correction factor? And I would, um, you know, make the argument that PBT quantifies that directly as opposed to using this, um, this sort of uh, calculated or estimated correction factor. And furthermore, um, you know, an important one is, is, that, is that PBT was really designed to inform hatchery management. Um, uh, and you can address, you know, hatchery practices. How does different rearing techniques or release sites affect return rates? But it also provides a wealth of information on salmonid life history, harvest patterns, trait heritability. And in this case, you know, this hatchery specific program is really benefiting our wild returns. Um, and, you know, as I um, as as I hope you take away from this is that, you know, in the Snake River Basin with our ESA listed runs of spring, summer Chinook and steelhead, what we've done is we've is that we've come up with more accurate estimates of escapement. And these are relevant to a number of different management purposes. Um, you know, first off, uh, escapement at Lower Granite Dam is decomposed using run reconstruction models to, to, to get derive population specific uh, abundance levels. And that and those data are then used for viability assessment. So very, very much uh, important from a management perspective. And another example with Chinook um, is that, you know, um, fishing seasons and regulations can be directly tied to abundance estimates at lower granite. And the example I would use there was that in 2018, our wild returns of spring summer Chinook were so low that it forced managers to restrict fishing access in the upper Salmon River to just below a hatchery as opposed to a wider range. So, so this has direct implications for um, the operation of fisheries. And, um, you know, I, I had a Mentimeter that asked you what your favorite um, species of salmon and steelhead was. Um, and the, the important take home is that, you know, PBT can be used on all of those species. Um, so it is widely applicable to other runs. Um, you know, potential examples would be like, for example, winter run Chinook in, this, in the Sacramento River. Um, there's also examples of captive breeding programs like Burbit in uh, northern Idaho, for which we are working on a PBT program or, or you know, in our group is. And then also, as I mentioned earlier, we've got the um, uh, blueback herring in North Carolina. So this is, you know, these are species of concern where you can use this technology to inform hatchery practices and form management decisions. And so, um, you know, just so you guys know, I, I didn't personally sample um, really any of those Chinook or uh, steelhead, all 38,000 of them. Um, and instead, I relied upon the, the efforts of a large number of individuals at a large number of organizations. And first and foremost, I'd really like to give a shout out to all the technicians in, in our lab here at Eagle Genetics Lab. Uh, pictured on the right hand side, they did a lot of heavy lifting in terms of getting um, those uh, genotypes generated and getting them into our parental uh, database, as well as our collaborating agencies um, that, are, that are listed here. So really, this was uh, required a, a Herculean effort on, on the behalf of a large number of people. And so, um, so in terms of a description of the methods, um, so we did have a manuscript that was recently accepted in the Canadian Journal. Um, I'm happy to pass it along. Here's my contact information. If you guys want, would like to get a copy of that, I'd be happy to send it to you. And if you have any questions about the specifics of the program, again, um, feel free to reach out to me. And so with that, I would like to um, take any questions. Thank you so much, John. Yes, we have time for questions. 
you, uh, remind you, you could type it your question in your chat into the chat window, or you could raise your hand and unmute yourself. Okay, we have a question from David. Can you identify the naturally spawned offspring of hatchery fish to the F2 generation? Um, so uh, this, uh, so Tom would, Tom DeLomas collaborator would probably be able to, I mean, we do have, um, there are estimates of um, uh, grandparentage. We can do grandparentage analysis um, under specific circumstances. Um, but in this case, uh, the PBT that we're doing here is strictly between um, parent offspring pairs and their uh, immediate offspring. Okay. Another question, are these PBT-based estimates now accepted among fed state tribal managers or are the traditional escapement estimates still being used? Um, so that's an excellent question. Um, my understanding, so I mean, so within Idaho Fish and Game, the values of escapement that we generate um, that are used are, are, are done using um, PBT. So, so I guess the answer there would be that, you know, we are the, the, the estimates of escapement that are used um, do include PBT. Any other questions from Mike? Do you ever get ambiguous results for the specific parents of hatchery returns? Um, yeah, so that's a, that's an excellent question. And, and one thing that I, I probably should have um, uh, elaborated on a little bit more was that, um, you know, so we're not just using genetic data. We also go through and we do some QA, QC for PBT assignments. And what I mean by that is that, you know, by and large, a lot of these hatcheries are providing information um, such as crossing records. So if we get something that has a marginal likelihood, let's say that it's right at our sort of acceptable threshold, what we can do is we can then go back and we can look at individual um, crossing records. And if we can, you know, if straight away, if we see that these two parents um, were in fact spawned at this hatchery, then we can use that as an independent line of evidence to, you know, to accept that. And also we have a genetic sex marker that's used to, and we, and we screen each of our individual PBT assignments to make sure that the offspring assignment to our parent pair is not between two females or, or two males. So, so we do, um, we, we certainly do some QA, QC um, to ensure that our PBT assignments are, um, reflective of, of um, you know, a high likelihood that that was in fact the case. Thanks, John. And before I get to the next question, I'll remind listeners that you're welcome to ask questions of either Tom, who was our first speaker, or John, who just wrapped up. Question from Karen, how well accepted are PBT information used for aging wild cell models? Um, so, so, so PBT in this case is really um, is only applicable to the hatchery component, um, and in terms of um, in term it, that is one of the utilities. And I, I, I actually meant to mention that, but I neglected to. But um, you know, much like CWTs or coded wire tags, you know, which were originally designed to identify hatchery and cohort of origin, PBT in the same way provides that same that same information. So we. So we are um, certainly able to um, to use PBT to say, okay, this fish is, you know, this fish that returned this year was produced by this brood year, so therefore it is um, th this age. Awesome. Another question: Have you looked at steelhead repeat spawning rates using your database? Um, so I am trying to think. I would um, repeat spawning. So like. So, hmm, that's a good question. So we've like in terms of Celts, um, we do that for our wild fish. We look at, at we can identify Celts using a combination of genetic and age data. But in terms of um, repeat spawning rates for so for if a fish is spawned in a hatchery, then it would be. <laughs> um lethally sampled so I, I don't I, maybe i'm misunderstanding it but i don't think that you know um, if a fish returns and, it, and it's used in the hatchery then um, it would be um, harvested and uh david swink swink if you're that didn't answer your question if you have follow-up feel free to to uh 
to ask, you know, undo your mic and ask it yourself. Are there any new additional questions out there? From Kevin, you mentioned the egg, egg box releases. Any other estimates of what proportion of fish are intentional versus unintentional escapement? So, um, yeah, that's a good question. So originally, um, when I was first kind of going through a lot of this analysis, I was really kind of interested in, in the proportion of um, intentional versus, or, or the proportion of, of fish that were unmarked, had no physical mark or physical tag um, as a function of hatchery and, and syncing that up with our estimates, um, like from the regional marking database. Um, but I, I haven't necessarily um, probed into that super, I, I sort of kind of went down that, um, um, went down that path, but then I, I kind of had to rein it in for sake of, um, of getting a, the, the sort of the, the paper together. But um, that, that is certainly something that would be, be worth um, looking into. Any, I see, Marika, do you want to jump in? Are you following on David's earlier question? I just wanted to clarify because, you know, say we have um, PBT of returning adults, you can at, at some level probably look at adult to adult return rates if say that spawner produce progeny um, across multiple years. I don't know if you could tell whether or not the, op, the returning offspring would be from a first spawn or yeah that's that's a good question to be honest with you um i'm not super sure in terms of you know so so it looks like david had commented yeah so adult to adult do all the hatcheries in your sample use lethal spawning and and my my my, my initial guess is yes but i i'm not an, i i should know more about all of the hatcheries but i don't and so that's I'm, i i don't know that answer off the top of my head but my suspicion is that we do lethal harvest but but i may be incorrect so i don't want to um say definitively one or the other sorry all right any other questions for john or tom um some someone's asking about cost you mentioned cost effective elaborate please cost per test yeah sure so um so um as tom alluded to in his talk so what we're dealing with um so our lab uses a gt seek method and we've essentially um so we use it um so essentially, at the end of the day, it's about five dollars per sample for consumables. So, um, and you know, we're dealing with about you know fifteen thousand brood stock on an annual basis. Um, yeah, so so certainly not free, but you know, the five five dollars per sample is um, you know the thing that you and you know traditionally, and I guess I should have made this plug, as you see in most uh, genetic talks, is at the very end they say, well, the cost of sequencing is going down, and um, which is true. Um, and so right now we're at a, a you know the cost have decreased through time, and right now we're sitting at about five dollars per sample for consumables, um, and and the expectation is that that it could get cheaper um, as we as we go through time. But, oh, and I guess, sorry, just real quick. So, you know, one of the things that uh, John Carlos Garza and Eric Anderson mentioned is that, you know, when you think about it as a alternative, so if you have, um, if you have a, like, for example, 131 million Chinook that were released or smolts that were released during this study period, and if you're coded wire tag, I think I saw in their report that it was like 17 cents per um, tag, um, you know, it quickly, if you're trying to tag entire, you know, 20 million, um, if you're trying to tag 20 million uh, smolts at 17 cents per smolt, um, you know, I think that that's where you get at this point where, you know, if you're if you're doing five dollars per sample times 15,000 brood stock, that's where you start um, looking at it in terms of cost savings relative to to other uh, marking and tagging techniques. Very helpful. I see uh, hand raised, Russell Scranton. Yeah, Jen, uh, this is Russell Scranton. I just had a quick question or clarification possibly, which is um, I think related to the kelp question is when you be, do PBT assessments for steelhead, if a hatchery fish spawns naturally, goes out the system, comes back again, are your, is your system able to detect that as a hatchery fish as it returns again for a second, second time spawning three years later? So 
multiple generations have gone by, does your database still tag it as a um, hatchery origin? Um, so, so is that to say that, so, I mean, assuming that the parents are in the database and are, sorry, are we talking about um, uh, offspring or, or, or a, a, um, a grand, a grandchild? Sorry. My question was when you have a hatchery steelhead that's parental, parental based tag marked and it spawns naturally, goes out of the system, goes back to the ocean, comes back as an adult again after being a kilt. Yeah. You know, multiple years have gone by age seven fish, age six, eight, you know, does your database still tag it as it comes back and detect it again as a hatchery version? Yeah, excellent, excellent question. So, um, so in general, you know, so we take our, like when we're, we're running our PBT baseline, um, what we'll do is we will, um, you know, so for example, if we're running um, um, fish that are, are arriving at the dam this year, we'll compare it against our entire PBT baseline, which will include fish back to 2008. And when we um, when we're filtering our PBT assignment, so it is entirely possible that a fish that is, you know, say seven years old will will show up as a PBT hit. What we do is we generally say, OK, the expectation is that th these fish would be coming from spawn year X, Y and Z. Um, and if it's outside of that, it, it'll sort of flag it. And again, that's one of those deals where we'll go by on a case by case basis and we'll say, OK, well, um, you know, this this fish pinged as the offspring of these two parents. We can go back into our records. And, and again, if you know, if we do see evidence that those that those fish were um, spawned together, then we'll accept that as a true a true, a true um, a hatchery offspring. So yeah, so we can detect it because we essentially start with our oldest database and we compare it against everything from then forward. Um, and but we sort of um, for sake of QA, QC, we, you know, the expectation is they're not, we're not going to be dealing with these super old fish, um, but we would get that hit and then we would sort of go by on a case by case basis and confirm it. If that, hopefully that, I'm sorry for misunderstanding the question there a couple of times, but hopefully that gets at it. Thank you, John. So. And if you're following the chat, you can see that Eric Stark has dropped some comments in there about a, a recent paper, a Copeland et al., that may be helpful as well. Sorry, Russell, were you trying to add more? Just said thank you. Oh, OK. Any other questions out there? Maybe this is a good point for me to pass it back to Marika Dobos for closing out. Now, thank everyone for joining us, myself, and also our speakers. Thank you, John and Tom. Thank you. Yeah, definitely want to get a last shout out to both of our speakers, John Hargrove and Tom DeLomas, for being able to present um, some really cool work to the group uh, revolving around some really cool genetic techniques that we're using for fish management. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, really enjoy the discussions and the questions and the interactions. So it's really cool. Um, to have the success in this webinar versus the opportunities we could have had in person. It's still been good. Um, the screen you sh that is up today shows the rest of the um, ETIS talks that we have for the remainder of this month. Uh, the next one coming up will be next Thursday. It will be a talk on advances in pit tag technology and what it gained for assessments that will be presented by Gabriel Brooks and Benjamin Sanford from NOAA Fisheries. And it will start at one o'clock Pacific time. So please tune in. Um, there is also a series in February uh, focused on data management, as Jen mentioned earlier. All that schedule will be available on the PNAMP website um, under the, the projects and tab in the ETIS. And Amy just put a link to that in the chat room if folks are interested. Um, also wanted to kind of give a shout out to the uh, PNAMP's fish monitoring work group. There will be meeting on February 11th from 9 to 11.30 Pacific time. Um, that I also uh, just kind of wanted to speak a little bit further. This uh, fish monitoring work group, we hope to um, 
with this work group continue to put together workshops like um, this ETIS series um, that we're showing this month together um, and present future talks and hopefully future in-person meetings that um, will help kind of kick start some sub subgroups to work on some advanced collaborative cross agency discussions and uh, product related to past PNAMP workshops or other common problems. Um, a couple examples are uh, some of you guys attended the SMOLT, um, SMOLT uh, analysis workshop last year, so um, there's some work to try and address some bias in SMOLT out migrant analysis and also some data exchange standards to share operation data from screw traps. And so uh, keep in mind that this is an avenue to bring um, forward some thoughts and some ideas to the group so that uh, we can start working on um, collaborating and um, working through these questions. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, conclude this uh, webinar and again thank you for everybody's time today.